Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for the invite to talk today. I'm actually a micropaleontologist by training. So this is a little bit of a, a deviation for me. It all began really during COVID when opportunities to get into the lab and the field was much more challenging. We were pushed to create digital field trips uh, and develop digital skill sets that we had didn't have before in order to create digital field trips for our students at very short notice. And that sort of led to a number of sort of interesting collaborations with vertebrate paleontologists at the University of Birmingham, also other non-academic stakeholders, um, as well as our undergraduate student and a range of postdoctoral uh, researchers. That really sort of got me interested in that bigger question of, you know, we were all contemplating during COVID kind of, we wanted to get out, we were really appreciating those open spaces. It really sort of reignited my, my love of UK geology and appreciation of sort of thinking about how we value paleontological heritage, how we should protect it, how we make it a sustainable resource. And so I'm gonna to be touching upon sort of relatively new research um, from the last few years around dinosaur track sites specifically, um, in this case for paleontology in the UK. Perfect, thank you very much. Okay, so dinosaurs, incredibly charismatic organisms. They dominated terrestrial ecosystems for most of the Mesozoic from around 220 million years ago to 66 million years ago. And they had a huge array of morphologies and ecologies. And much of what we know about dinosaurs comes from their skeletal or their body fossil record. Um, the that informs us of aspects of their behavior, how they lived and what they looked like. But actually the body fossil record is really notoriously incomplete. Actually one of the most complete dinosaurs ever discovered is on display at the uh, Natural History Museum in London, Sophie the Stegosaurus, and most one of the most, if not the most complete dinosaur in the world at 85% intact. So we're still missing some information. It's also quite hard to recover, find and extract dinosaur uh, body fossils. So there could be really long, a lot of preparation involved and a long lag between actually finding something and understanding what its scientific value or in the information encoded within that is. An alternative source of information that can tell us about how dinosaurs lived, what they looked like, who was living where, are dinosaur tracks and trackways. These are generally in situ. Um, they don't move far from where you know, they were originally formed. A block might fall out of a cliff, but otherwise we can be relatively sure that if we find a track, the dinosaur once was there. Whereas we know that with bones and skeletal material, it can actually be transported quite far from the original environment in which the dinosaur may have lived. They're also more abundant. Obviously an organism has one skeleton, but it can make many, many millions of tracks within its lifetime. And even with the vagaries of the geological record, there's quite a high potential um, that, you know, for some of those tracks being preserved in certain environments at least. And what we often find is that these tracks might be um, preserved in different areas to where we might find body fossils. And actually because of different preservational biases operating, they might be in different stratigraphic horizons. So actually they can help to fill gaps left by the, uh, where we have gaps in our body fossil records. So together the two can be uh, very powerful. When I talk about dinosaur tracks, I'm talking about an individual track. Uh, so take a look at that photo down on the lower left-hand side. If I talk about a trackway, it means there's more than one track uh, probably made by the same uh, organism. And in addition to telling us about when and where the organism was, we can also infer from the tracks themselves, things, aspects of behavior, interactions between different groups of organisms, how they moved, um, aspects of life history, ecology and anatomy. So lots of sort of heavily complementary information, some of which is not available from the body fossil record. There are some caveats to the track record though. Um, if we look at the major groups of dinosaurs, which are outlined here, you can see that 
these groups often have different types of tracks, but actually within each of these groups, we really can't get beyond these very broad taxonomic groups. So for example, theropods, you know, most well known perhaps for the carnivorous um, bipedal forms. So things like a T-Rex or a, a Megalosaurus if you're in the UK. So these three toed distinctive uh, tracks. We've got the ornithopods, also tridactyle, can be, they're bipedal, but can sometimes operate um, on four legs. So the ornithopods, you might be familiar with something like an iguanodon. We've got sauropods, so these long necked, long tailed, relatively small headed dinosaur group. But also they're non tridactyle, so not three toed uh, tracks. Uh, quadrupedal, leave distinctive traces in the fossil record. And then we can broadly group a fourth major group that we can identify known as the thyrophorans. So these are typically our armored dinosaurs, things like your stegosaurs, your ankylosaurs, and your ceratopsians. So we can get, they, there's enough distinction between tracks to distinguish these broad taxonomic groups, but we're really quite difficult to go below this to identify individual species from their tracks alone, in large part because the anatomy of the foot's quite similar within those groups. But also with the vagaries of the, again, the geological record, it can create some uncertainty in making very precise assignments at that level. So those are the four main groups that I'll be talking about and thinking about in this talk. And I would just say, obviously, the ideal scenario would be you'd find the dinosaur fossil at the end of the uh, track, in which case you could identify exactly what species was uh, the track maker. Unfortunately, death traces are exceptionally rare in the geological record. Um, this is the world's longest uh, death track of 9.7 metres from a horseshoe crab from the Solnhofen uh, limestone in the mid-Jurassic. And you can see it's sort of little meandering path after it's thought to have got dropped into a, a tropical lake and uh, slowly expired from a lack of oxygen. Other caveats that can make identifying the precise track make a little trickier are things like the sediment type. So the course of the sediment, the less detail that will be preserved of the uh, track maker's foot. Um, so you could imagine that things like a conglomerate will preserve less detail. Also they're preserved, it's typically a higher energy environment, so less likely to preserve the track to start with. So we get biases in what sediments preserve tracks. But also the sediment consistency is really important for preserving high quality tracks that allow us to extract information. You can see on this lower image going from left to right, if you have firmer sediment, oh, there we go. If you have uh, firmer sediment, you can preserve firm and fine grain sediment. You can preserve quite a high level of detail. So you can see, for example, here in this tridactyl track, claws and um, foot pad impressions. Whereas as you get to more sloppy sediment or coarser sediment, alternatively, you might get collapse and fall in as the, the organism extracts its foot from the sediment. So you, you lose some of that definition. But that ultimately does mean there's some bias in the environments where we find tracks preserved that need to be taken into account when we're making inferences of what the paleo environmental or ecological um, affinities of the different dinosaur groups were. There's also a few different types of tracks that you might encounter. We have the true track. This is where, this is the surface that represents where the organism or the track maker directly interacted with the sediment. So it's sort of the direct impression. We have under tracks, which form when the foot compresses the sediment and the track is sort of, or some impression of it, permeates towards lower levels. So you see a loss of definition and increase in size as you move to lower levels in the sediment. So you can imagine that if you're trying to reconstruct the body size of your dinosaur from the track, which is something that's very frequently done along with trying to estimate how fast they're moving. If you're using an under track, you're gonna get a very different answer to using a true track. The final type of track that we find in the geological record are called casts. And these are typically where the true track has been infilled. And actually in the UK, this is one of the most common forms, ways in which we find dinosaur tracks, 
typically, for example, you'd find a sandstone infilling a mudstone and the mudstone may be eroded away, leaving a sandstone cast in kind of an overlaying unit or a broken block on the ground. And you can see that in that top image, an example of what that might look like. So studying dinosaurs in the UK is actually quite exciting. And you might think everything has been discovered, but there's still so much activity and new uh, discoveries all the time. In the last few years alone, we've seen new discoveries of uh, species of spinosaurs. Um, but it goes right back to the beginning. This year, uh, 2024, it's actually the 200 year anniversary since the first naming of the first dinosaur, Megalosaurus. Um, which was described by William Buckland back in the early 1800s. So the UK has that sort of legacy of being involved right from the start with the development of the field, but also with the field of dinosaur track research in terms of the earliest scientific report of tracks and connecting those to a dinosaur track maker comes from the mid 1850s where these distinctive tridactyle tracks found, you might have seen them on um, the Isle of Wight, Hanover Point, were connected to an iguanodon track maker, so sort of herbivorous, uh, relatively large dinosaur. So lots of exciting activity has been going on in the UK for a long time, and in part that's because we have amazing exposures of Mesozoic rocks from which to find these organisms and reconstruct how they, lo how they looked, where they lived and how they lived. But what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of the talk, I've got three sort of broad sections and we'll see if we get to the third one. But I wanna say something a little bit about looking back at this history, actually what does, what do we know about our dinosaur track record? Um, and what do the tracks add to our understanding of the body fossil record? How do we measure the value of tracks? This is a really important question when it comes to, for example, as scientists, we're trying to assess the relative value of our contribution. Is this a new site? Is it the biggest site? But also from a conservation perspective, if you're trying to look at prioritizing resource to protect a site, to um, better communicate a site, how might you do that? And then if I have time, I'll talk about a specific conservation case study where we utilized a range of new digital tool sets to try and actually unravel how a, a a current dinosaur track site exposed down in Dorset is evolving as it's exposed to visitor wear and tear, but also natural processes and how one might intervene or if intervention is necessary to ensure the longevity of that site. So start sort of one of the first things we sort of set about doing was building this database to understand what is the legacy of dinosaur tracks in the UK. You'd think 200 years of research we've done this, we haven't. Um, so the map on the left hand side here shows the outcrop of Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous rocks within the UK and the dots on there represent individual or unique track occurrences. So we've got more than 250 unique occurrences, that's where we have a distinctive dinosaur track maker, so a sauropod, a theropod, ornithopod um, or one of the armoured dinosaur groups at a single location. So many locations will yield many of the same tracks. We only count them once because we want to know about unique occurrences. If you look at that distribution and follow down the pie charts on the right hand side, you can see that the vast majority of tracks are found in England with uh, far fewer in uh, Isle of Skye and down in South Wales. And that really sort of maps to where we find those rock exposures. Similar to where we find the rock exposures, both through inland working and quarrying, but also uh, the coastal exposure availability, we predominantly see uh, Cretaceous track occurrences being reported with uh, then Jurassic and Triassic being much uh, rarer. And the majority of the occurrences are reported from coastal settings. There's constant erosion, new material being eroded. People walk along the beach. You will have seen in the last few years, there have been a number of really big um, sort of news stories of children discovering large um, tridactyl prints on the, the beach in South Wales, for instance, and up in North Yorkshire. A lot less is discovered through quarrying today than it was perhaps historically, but there is uh, still a small role for that. So we predominantly find tracks in uh, sandstone. As I said, this is the dominant um, 
lithology is fluvial environments you've got wet you're predominantly going to pres be preserving tracks where you have sort of some kind of moisture in the sediment so you know river edges um coastal environments edges of lakes those kind of environments so sandstones followed by limestones are the dominant lithologies with very little in uh, mudstones because it erodes away and conglomerates because of that high energy and uh, difficult um, coarse grain size also making it difficult to preserve tracks. And just showing the breakdown of the environments where we find them, you can see that the yellow parts of the pie are much bigger. So again, the fluvial and coastal environments are the dominant, which maps to where the types of lithologies that we're finding them in. So tracks are most commonly found in Cretaceous fluvial sandstones exposed on the coast. As a very broad brush summary. Um, in terms of what the tracks actually look like, we can break them very broadly into two groups. The tridactyl tracks, so the three-toed tracks, which comprise the, the theropods and the ornithopod groups. And those are shown in yellow and comprise more than uh, three quarters of the reports that we have. And then a quarter of the reports are for the non-tridactyl, so sauropods and armored dinosaur groups. And there is a question of whether or not there, there is some bias operating here, because fundamentally it's a lot easier to identify uh, something like this that looks very distinctly like a foot and indeed the earliest reports we have from the 19th century and really up until uh, very recently were of tridactyl tracks compared to say a sauropod track where if you just had a single track you could easily you know think it was just a hole in the rock and erosive feature and it's perhaps only when you start to get these chains of or large trackways that you recognize it as something different so we actually in the UK have only been recognizing that we have sauropod and armored dinosaur trackways since really the late 90s. So it's quite new. And for those that are very keen on the dinosaurs, you can break that down further. And it just shows that um, ornithopods, so in that bright blue color, comprise about 40% of our records, um, followed by theropods uh, with much smaller numbers of the non-tridactyle organisms. Another way of looking at this data is thinking about how the track record goes through time. So this is the number of track occurrences. So on the y-axis versus time going from the Triassic on the left to the Cretaceous on the right. And each of the different colors represents a different dinosaur group. And you don't have to worry too much about the detail here. The main thing I just want you to see is that if you actually look at it through time, you can see it's quite discontinuous, the UK record of tracks. Um, and then the second feature is that we see a switch from that green yellow color to that bright blue color. So we see a fundamental switch from sauropod don dominated communities to um, ornithopod dominated communities as we move from the Triassic into the lower Cretaceous. And throughout the arm, the dinosaurs, that sort of as the dark blue you can barely see, exceptionally rare. In the next panel down, panel B, we have the body fossil record. Oh, so you got it? Yeah, the body fossil record up here. And you can see it's much more continuous overall, but it also shows that switch from the green to the blue color, as you move from the Triassic into the Cretaceous, as implying that we're seeing this sort of real switch in the dinosaur communities recorded in both. So the tracks are giving us, despite all the biases operating and the different biases operating on the, the track versus the body fossil records, they're giving us a relatively consistent pattern of change. And you also see that the most occurrences occur in the early Cretaceous for both records as well. If we overlay the body fossil record in the blue in this lower panel C with the um, Track, track record, which is in the orange, it just highlights that sort of that relative similarity of pattern, but the dis, the difference in um, their distribution. And if you compare that to the availability of terrestrial rocks with the green showing where we have lots of terrestrial rocks, as you would expect, we find tracks where we have terrestrial rocks. You're not going to find dinosaurs wading through the water. Um, we do find body fossil records more continuously, despite the fact that we have marine rocks interspersed. 
because of course they can be swept out to sea. So we can find um, a record, a limited body fossil record during marine uh, intervals. So this is the last figure on this particular aspect, just to another way of looking at this with time this time on the Y axis, going from Triassic at the lower part of the figure up to the Cretaceous in the top. And the main thing I wanted to show here was that if we, I've shown you a comparison between the, the body fossil and the track record in terms of the pattern. But if you take a closer look at this and for each of these groups, so for example, if we take the sauropodomorphs, you've got two columns here. The column on the left shows the distribution of track through time that tell us uh, when the dinosaurs were there. Um, and then when we know they were there in the dark green in this case, based on their body fossil records. So obviously more continuous as we've just discussed. And that's repeated for each of the four major groups here. And you can see, if you look at the early Cretaceous, our Wealdon and Purbeck groups that characterize much of the South coast exposed along the Jurassic uh, coast, we actually have really good coverage in both the body and the uh, track record for all dinosaur groups being represented. Whereas if you look, say in the late Triassic, you can see we actually have a terrible body fossil record. There's no dark colors there. We've only got pale colors. So the only record we really have of dinosaurs in that very early interval for them when they're evolving is from the track record. Um, but we also find that in discrete intervals, such as in this case, this lower unit is a, the raven scar from the mid Jurassic. It didn't quite fit because it was a time equivalent unit. So I've put it isolated here. You can see there are gaps again in the body fossil record, in this case, in the yellow and the blue, where the tracks tell us that we had a diverse community with all four groups being represented, but actually the body fossil record only provides evidence of two, two of those groups. So just to say, used together, these records can be hugely complementary. Tracks often take a back seat to the body fossil record. And uh, I would argue there's been a little bit of snobbery about them in the past, perhaps, but there's been a real renaissance and huge public interest and huge scientific interest in them in the last few years, or the last decade or so, really. And of course, the importance of tracks will change through time with each new discovery, its relative importance changes. So that was a little bit of a snapshot of what we know about the UK dinosaur record. But actually, if you want to go out today and see tracks, of course, many have been removed to museums. You can go and see them today. But for the most part, there's loads of tracks out there. Museums do not want to store them. They're heavy. They're difficult to extract. If they're on a large surface, it's just not going to happen. Um, but if you do want to, as a member of the public or a scientist, go out and look at dinosaur tracks today, there are 14 places you can go around the UK to see them. They're shown by the stars here, which are color coded by the time interval in which they occur. And they sort of really nicely map that distribution that we've just seen. So again, we've got some Scottish examples from the Isle of Skye. We've got North Yorkshire, South Wales, and then really the South Coast of the UK. And so for the second part, I just want to touch upon actually, okay, we have these sites. What is their relative, what do we know about them? Are there scientific gaps? Um, what are the priorities for protecting these sites? Should there be priorities? Um, what, how are these communicated to the public? Because there is huge potential and excitement in the public for understanding dinosaurs. It's a great vehicle to um, bringing people into STEM. There's sort of tourism benefits, sort of much sort of very broad scale, both educational, scientific and cultural uh, value. But actually, what do we know about these sites? And so that was the, the next component working in conjunction, conjunction with the non-academic stakeholders. We're interested in knowing what could we do to better protect this valuable geological heritage? Um, where could we put more communication in? Where could we put uh, what should be protected that isn't currently protected? And of course, when you start talking about determining the value of a site, it's a little bit of a tricky thing. Um, but of course, it is something that we sort of fundamentally do as scientists and we actually sort of need to do in a sort of resource management perspective. And because of the renaissance of dinosaur tracks and huge new discoveries occurring globally and the 
lots of track sites being sort of registered as national geoparks or um, becoming sort of very important uh, tourist attractions elsewhere. UNESCO put together a, a range of ways in which you might uh, understand the scientific value of a site and the cultural value of a site so that you could make the case for your site being globally unique. And of course, to do this, you need to make sure the data is easy to collect so that everyone can collect it and make the comparisons or historical data can be you know, brought in. Um, ideally, as little subjectivity as possible to make the comparisons valid and also just easy to use and not too complicated. And so these are the, we ended up with 17 criteria. So we decided to use this scheme. In the science value categories, there are nine categories that think about, we value, we, we discuss the scientific value in terms of the size of the site, the number of tracks reported, the number of trackways, the number of different dinosaur groups that are represented, the number of levels. So the stratigraphic coverage over which we find them at a site how well preserved they are, so what information we can get from them. The historical value, so in the development of the field or our understanding of the group and how much they've been published on with the idea that the more they've been published on, the more important they are. Not all perfect, I will accept that, um, but that's where we are. And so what you do for each of these categories is there's a scoring system of one to five. And you can see this example in the lower here. So we will assign for each category in this example, size of area, which the dinosaur tracks cover. Values of one to five are associated with different sized areas. You assign a score for each category, add them all together and get a total score for scientific value. You do the same thing for cultural value categories. This includes education, um, access to site, how many people visit, things like how well protected the site is, how close it is to other tourist attractions, so it might be drawing people in. And just to emphasize that these are of course snapshots because these can change. And of course, from our perspective, we were hoping to increase the cultural value. So what is it now and what could it be? These are the 14 sites where we can currently find dinosaur tracks today. You do not need to read this table. Um, it's ordered in terms of the total combined score but I just wanna highlight a couple of key features. Looking at the orange column, the total possible score you could get is 45 and the values go from around nine to 31. So if you have a high scientific value, it means it's a big site. There's probably a lot of diversity, a lot of stratigraphic coverage, a lot of different uh, tracks or trackways at that site. If you have a low scientific value, it probably means you're a small site, there's not much diversity and um, it doesn't cover sort of a, a very large area in terms of time either. In terms of cultural value, which is shown in the blue column, we tend to find sites with higher cultural value, they'll be better developed, there'll be more information on them available at the site and just on the internet, resources available for visitors, they're easy to find, easy to access, so lots of people go to them. Lower cultural value um, <coughs> being the opposite of that. What's interesting is that if you plot those two values together, there is no direct relationship. And you, this plays out over a global scale between scientific and cultural value. So you do have to think about what your priorities are when you're using these kind of schemes. And that can be nicely seen by comparing Ardley Quarry from Oxfordshire with Spyway Quarry in Dorset. They have the same total combined score of 33, but very one has high scientific value, but low cultural value, and then vice versa for Spyway Quarry. I'm just going to touch upon a details of a few of these specific dinosaur tracks to make them a bit more real, I guess, and tangible. So the highest scoring and arguably the most scientifically important site in the UK that we have is Bendrick Rocks in South Wales. I don't know, has anyone in this room actually been to Bendrick Rocks? No, no one's been to visit the Mercy of Mudstone. Okay. Um, so Bendrick Rocks, scientifically significant, but quite a low cultural value but comes out as the most important site in the UK. Going back 220 million years, it probably would have looked something like this, that coastal outcrop, um, quite a warm desert environment, quite you know, uh, prone to flash floods. You would have had very early um, sauropodomorphs. You would have had some theropods and uh, it's a very nice reconstruction that Mark did for us 
uh, here demonstrating based on the tracks how they might have interacted. If you visit the site today, it looks like this. These series of wave cut platforms in this sort of uh, red desert um, or sort of red um, sands and muds and silts. It's right on the coast, so it's subject to the, the tides. And you can see a lot of those dimples that you can see in the surface are actually dinosaur tracks. Not all of them, but quite a lot of them. And if you were to look closely, you can sort of see some that are, you can just about make out they're sort of three toed, whereas some are much better preserved than others. So if you were to go, you park in this industrial state behind this, you walk onto the beach, it's used by dog walkers, geological groups. Um, you can access some information through geological speciality groups online. It's just starting to feed through into some of the tourist sites, but there's no information when you arrive at the site. In fact, most people that are there have no idea what they're looking at are dinosaur tracks. So actually, whilst it's accessible in some senses, because you can just walk onto the beach and just literally walk across and see things, there's no information or way of interacting or engaging with the audience. So they're not able to fully appreciate the site. There are aspects, if you were thinking about developing sites, of course, about safety relative to, you know, tides, seaweed covering and things like that. Um, it is a triple SI because of the outcrop of um, uh, the, the rock outcrop is an exa a good example of the sequence. And, you know, this is, I guess, one of those complexities around maybe you don't want to advertise sites too much because, you know, when it does seem to appear in the news, it's been subject to theft and vandalism, people taking bits of it out. And actually, more than 600 tracks have been reported here um, as of 1997. Actually, the best tracks have been removed and taken to the Cardiff Museum. So what you see is sort of left behind. But as I said, the sea constantly is eroding new surfaces and nobody's evaluated this site since the 1990s. So this is where there's sort of the way in which we looked at, assessed, monitored sites has changed so much what we can do that actually there's a real opportunity to go back and do some work at this site, which we'll be doing in the new year. In contrast, the lowest scoring site is literally a kilometre along the, the, the road at Swanbridge. Um, it's lovely pub, uh, the captain's wife. We spent hours searching for the reported dinosaur tracks at this site. There was limited documentation from the 1990s that they'd been found there, but there were no images, location, horizon. They were low abundance. It, this is a case of where there is real differences in the scientific documentation of sites that make it quite difficult to then assess their scientific value. So really sort of speaking towards, we need to move towards standardized processes for reporting key values to enable reuse of data, but also sort of for things like understanding sites, uh, particularly if they've disappeared or been eroded away. So I would argue that whilst Bendrick Rocks has a lot of potential to increase its cultural value for the, the local economy, actually Swanbridge, perhaps not one that we're gonna signpost people to, and not something that we would target for uh, increasing its legal protections either. I'm going to touch upon the two other sites uh, that I highlighted previously, Ardley Quarry and Spyway Quarry, because there are really, really two of the loveliest examples in the UK, despite not necessarily being right up there at the top. And this sort of represents a bit of a quandary in terms of that scientific value scoring I, I talked about. It's easy to apply and it feels like if you have more horizons, it should be more scientifically valuable, but it also kind of misses a trick. And this is where I think there's nuance that you need people to come in and understand the nature of the sites rather than perhaps just taking every value at, at you know, all of the values at face value, so to speak. So Ardley Quarry in Oxfordshire, um, quarrying for ag aggregate mid-Jurassic limestones, they uncovered what is the largest UK dinosaur track site ever discovered. There were um, dinosaur trackways from sauropods and theropods stretching hundreds of meters, um, hundreds and hundreds of tracks. And you can see an example of what that looked like uh, from the GPS position of the different tracks and an example of one of the sauropod trackways there on the right hand side. And these things are sort of 
sauropod track they're sort of this big and about 40 centimeters deep so they're pretty substantive with this large sediment displacement around the rim we can imagine the foot's gone in and pushed the mud up around so as i said it's the largest uk site but actually it doesn't score very high on scientific value because it's on a single horizon and there's only two dinosaur groups represented but the information within those tracks is hugely valuable it was the first dinosaur track site to ever show a change in dinosaur gait in the world. So we see a, a shift from a trot to a run of a theropod. That provided information on how they moved their, their legs under their body as they changed gait. So informing aspects of anatomy and um, anatomical modeling. We found that two different types of sauropod, titanosauriforms, so the really big things, um, not in the UK, but you know, those Argentosaurus, Patagonosaurus and things like that. And the non-Titanosaurus, so something like um, a dip, uh, Diplodocid, um, again, not in the UK, but those are sort of classic examples of these two groups. So the really big ones and the slightly smaller um, groups, first time they were ever seen together at the same time, the body fossil record actually indicated many millions of years or a big evolutionary gap and that they didn't overlap. But here, saw them overlapping. Evidence for multi-species sauropod herds, lots of different aspects. It's the, also the only site that's been designated a triple SI solely based on the tracks. So actually sort of an underestimated scientific value, significant access issues, hence a terrible cultural value score. It's currently a landfill site. So you will never again be able to see this site. <laughs> um, and that's just an example of where there are these competing interests where you have sort of commercial interests. Um, you can get in, make observations, but actually the sort of legacy of the site, you need to make sure that you have that documentation so that we can sort of still work on the site. People can still view it and understand what it looked like, particularly as the science of what we can do with even old images has really moved on the information we can extract. And the other sort of exact opposite of that is Spyway Quarry in Dorset. This is actually my favorite UK dinosaur track site. It is the most accessible track site in the UK. You can walk to it, 10 minutes walk from a car park. Um, really well, lots of information about the site, you can find it online, really easy to see. You turn up at the quarry, massive round dimples in the ground, over a hundred of them. You know, really easy to imagine you can sit in basically a sauropod track used by school groups, lots of different, uh, both sort of general and local and specific interest groups, quite low scientific value, single horizon, single dinosaur type, very poor preservation. And so I think just to sort of bring that section to an end, just to say that actually, you know, Assessing value is difficult. We do have to be careful when we're giving information to non-academic stakeholders to implement actions that we actually sort of provide the nuance as well. That there is potential in the UK certainly to develop a number of sites that are still in existence to increase their value where that's not going to endanger the site itself, which is, I guess, as an academic, that's been a real learning curve, trying to get that balance between, I feel like everyone should be really excited about dinosaurs and we should be doing everything we can to communicate it, but actually there are tensions there. And then where we have gaps in how those classic sites that we need to go and fill those scientific documentation gaps before the sites are lost to the sea. So really emphasizing that we need standard community protocols put in place by non-academic stakeholder bodies that manage our heritage to make sure that for conservation and monitoring, we're collecting the same type of data and particularly useful data. Um, and nowadays that's 3D documentation of sites. It's easy to do, you can do it on your phone and it just provides a long-term legacy that we can utilize in lots of different ways. I've got about five minutes left. so. I'm gonna just very briefly say something about my favorite sites, Byway Quarry. This is a very specific case study that speaks to understanding the value of the site and how we try to disentangle how we could better preserve the site against the natural weathering and the human-based tensions. So Spyway Quarry is found down in Dorset, uh, near Corfe Castle. It, 
It was discovered in 1997 by quarrymen. Um, they recognized what it was. The land was owned by the National Trust. So they told the National Trust what they found because they were just obviously um, taking out the limestone for building. National Trust did a report. It never sort of really got out into the wider literature, but the decision was that the site should be preserved and eventually access restored for the public good. It was uh, covered up while quarrying continued in the local area. And it stayed that way for well over 10, 15 years. And then in 2014, it was uncovered. This is a site around, I don't know, 200 square meters. It was uncovered for the first time with the help of a number of volunteers ready to open it to the public. And a 3D model was created of the site at that time and made freely available online. And then in 2016, it was open to the public. You could walk over the surface, you know, anytime, anywhere. This is what it looks like if you go today. You can see the information plaque where there's the black arrow and it's this curved surface with these large sort of depressions, round shaped depressions that here are filled with water and this really prominent crisscrossing fractures across the surface, which creates problems. So this is a close up of what the tracks at the site look like. You can see these distinctive circular depressions characteristic of these large sauropods moving across what once was a shelly beach uh, in a tropical climate. The displaced rim um, is, can be seen around the edge. These are around sort of 50 to 90 centimeters in diameter, so quite large. And this is sort of a, a likely sort of environmental reconstruction with something like these brachiosaurs. And we asked the question here, um, how has the site changed since it was ex sort of opened and uncovered and opened to the weather and the public? Why has it changed if it has changed? And can we do anything and should we do anything? And so one of the things we did was there was this model from 2014 and because that model existed, we could make another model in 2021 to compare to 2014. So this is the, an example of the 2014 model. We made a 2021 model, which is that top. And in this case, we've drawn over identifying where the tracks in each of those reconstructions are, what the outline of those are. You can compile those two to create an integrated schematic site map that tells you how many tracks there are at the site and enables you to develop, um, see how the margins have changed and what's identifiable today versus in the past and vice versa. So for example, if things are covered by vegetation, they've weathered away. And because we built 3D models, this takes a few hours, you take about 1500 photos, you get not just the X and Y dimensions, you get the depth dimensions. So in these lower panels that are highly colored, you can see the yellow dots in the middle represent where those tracks are. So we get some more information. One of the aspects of this site when it was initially uncovered was to manage visitor numbers, make it freely available to manage visitor numbers though, by not advertising hugely to start with. So we wanted to understand how many people are actually using it, which is something we didn't know. Um, we've installed visitor counters at the site. We looked at Google Analytics and a variety of different sort of online resources where people record visits. We found the site was visited by about 10,000 visitors a year. So you sort of think about UK um, tourism and sort of potential for bringing people in. Obviously, weekends and holidays were most popular and people spent on average about 20 minutes at the site. We installed cameras to understand where people moved on the surface to see if that coincided with where, for example, we might see more damage on the tracks. And this is a heat map with yellow meaning people go there a lot, purple meaning they don't go there quite so much. And you can see that where this is overlaid on a, the photogrammetric model of the quarry, and you can see that where those yellow hotspots are, down in the bottom left-hand corner, that's where the information panel is. So great, everyone goes to the information panel. But they also tend to go then just to the big clusters of big obvious tracks. They don't tend to wander around the surface much, which makes sense. If you don't really know what you're looking for, you're gonna go for the big obvious things. We looked at how the fractures were distributed across the surface because the whole surface is covered and it's leading to 
you know, you can you can see obvious damage occurring along those fractures. Um, this is a heat map of the fracture damage with dark colors meaning more damage, lighter colors meaning less damage. And if we overlay the two photogrammetric models, we can figure out the difference between the two in a quantitative sense. This is the same track from 2021 versus 2014. And in this 2014 one, the red color indicates where material has been lost since 2021 and the blue where it's addition. And you can see material has been lost along the fractures that permeate the whole surface in the tracks and around the edges of the tracks. Uh, the addition of material was in the cracks where rubble's been moved around through time. Uh, and this is the scale bar, that big blue blob. If you play that out across the whole surface, you can see there's a lot of red and a lot of blue. Stuff's moving around, it's on the fractures and it's around the edges of the tracks. All tracks have shown damage since 2014 when the site was first open to the public and the weather. And the ultimate impact of that is tracks are just becoming less distinct um, and eventually the site will sort of become uh, less, it will become more and more difficult to identify tracks over the next sort of coming decade or so. And by putting all that information together, we were able to assess that actually whilst visitors will obviously contribute towards that damage of the surface, actually it's natural processes that are really causing this destruction. Um, in that fracture network in particular, we have vegetation in there, we have freeze thaw process leading to widening of the cracks. You can also see in this example, really distinctive um, materials broken away here at the edges from the fracture and into the track. So it's defoliating the surface along these fractures. The, fra the tracks fill with water. Um, water. Rainwater is slightly acidic, so it's eroding internal features. It's a slope, water, abrasion of dust, rocks that come off the rock quarry surface, they're all moving down and just damaging the surface. So natural processes, sort of the most, um, the most prevalent cause of change at that particular site. It is a shame and the site is changing and it will eventually disappear. Quarrying is continuing in the area, so there is the possibility of discovering new sites that could be isolated. Um, if we're realistic and looking globally, the only way to protect these sites long term is to cover them with a big uh, atmospheric controlled dome. That is very, very expensive, uh, has been discussed. It's just not possible in terms of resources. Um, and actually, the Jurassic Coast Trust that manages the site, whilst the National Trust owns it, they really have this ethos of, you know, the Jurassic Coast was just, it's, um, was created by erosion. It erodes and continues to evolve through time. So actually sort of the, the site changing is really part of that story for them. And so the key thing with all of these sites really becomes that, okay, it's difficult to, we can't protect that site in situ. We definitely can't extract it, it's huge. Um, so it's really about, as I said, building that documentation so we can sort of preserve that site in some sense, uh, longer term and 3D models and visual documentation is a key. So my final thought is just to say, uh, dinosaur tracks in the UK, there are lots of them. Um, they've been part of our story for a really long time and they're a really valuable component of our geo heritage that can both yield scientific and cultural value for many different groups of people, but they are a transient resource. Um, and so we do have to make sure that we have appropriate documentation and management of those sites to ensure that at least we can retain them for as long as possible. So thanks for listening and any questions? <laughs>